Thanks, Humphrey. I'll, I'll look at Hood. I'm not an expert in brokerages, so just keep that in mind, but I have to look at Hood. Um, let's take a look. Maybe I can call them a software stock. It's a little bit of a reach, but let me call them a software stock. Uh, call it FinTech. I mean, personally, to me, it's just a brokerage, but they are doing different things. I built the software myself as an alternative to Bloomberg because Bloomberg's too expensive. They're not customer friendly. They're really kind of a ridiculous company in general, and they banned me from using their product, even though I was a customer for 17 years. And I'm sorry, I was a customer since I was 17. That's 24 years. I was even a customer while I was in prison. I was on my Bloomberg from prison. Think about that. They banned me. I got something for you. Don't worry. You think I can't reverse engineer your software? You think I can't make better software? Man. Get the VS Code open, man. Come on. No preferred stock, class A, class B, no class C. 126, no, 123. Class B and 761 class A. That's the pleb stock, I think. Uh, these will all be in my GitHub. I, I upload all my models on my GitHub. Balance sheets for financial institutions are always a little funky because you have the customer assets on there. So you got to go through them a little bit slowly. There's also this weird disparity about how do you value a bank versus a brokerage. Um, banks trade at book value. Brokerages don't. It's, it's a little bit, and something like this, which is like a fintech brokerage hybrid, what you don't want to do is overvalue it because The more bank-like it is, the less valuable it is on traditional like financial metrics, and you might get a little overzealous. But cash flow is cash flow, right? Let's see if we can figure out what's theirs cash and what's the customer cash. So they have the segregated cash, which I'm going to put somewhere else. Receivables from brokers, receivables from users. Well, I'm going to put receivables from users as not their cash for now. I'm going to put securities borrowed. I'll just throw in the receivables from brokers there too, even though that is a little tougher. Securities borrowed, I'm putting in there as well. Deposits with clearing houses, that could be their cash. is a little tricky. Fractional shares, user money. I think when in doubt, like, it's the user money. These balance sheets are a little more complicated than Biopharma. Thankfully, I'm a pro. Sort of.
OK, great. It kind of all balanced out if you see the user assets and payable to users, roughly the same number, so 24 billion each. We never want to do is like confuse what's their assets and what's not. And that can be very tricky in these banking situations. All right, the moment we've been waiting for. Let's look at the income statement. Okay, also very complicated. So we have transactions. This is, you can value the brokerage business like a normal business, I think. Interest, a bit different. Uh, other, others, 20%, 15% revenue, that's not that big of a deal. But transactions are real business, net interest, that's a bank. I think you have to be very careful how you value bank assets because the market values them a very specific way for a very specific reason. And if you value that interest income as valuable and then you double count it because you're counting the cash, you have to count one of them. Um, either count the cash, they have $8 billion, $7 billion or count the interest income, but don't count both, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 I got this, don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> Always make little mistakes like that, but the process corrects it. Uh, okay. I will say they have like amazing user awareness for um, a business where getting users is the hardest part. Gross margin isn't really like a traditional idea for a company like this, but we'll sort of fake it anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's fairly impressive. I see the marketing spend did jump. The revenue growth is most impressive. Was that fifty, almost fifty percent? Jeez. What's the market cap? Twenty billion. Seven billion cash, no debt. Ooh. Got a big margin of safety. The enterprise value is twelve billion. It really recovered from the GameStop fiasco. It, it kind of shows you that re really retail investors kind of have nowhere else to go. Like, is Schwab and E-Trade too complicated for them? Or it's not fun enough? Their mobile apps suck? Uh, I'm not sure. It's probably that their mobile apps suck and they, they didn't have a mobile first approach. That was like the Facebook insight that saved Facebook. The metrics are quite important as well. How many customers do they have? How many customers do they add? What's the average balance of the customer? All that stuff. I think I'm still doing them backwards. Most companies um, do the balance, do the, the columns, uh, the other order around. Anyway, I think we got this.
Wow. I wonder what their AUM is. ARPU, $341 a user a quarter. That's why these guys will spend $1,000 to get a user. Um, they're making 341 bucks, at least of revenue, off every user. And most of that's going to be all contribution margin. So if, if you're Robinhood and the average customer lasts two years, it's like rational to pay up to like 1200 bucks a customer or more. That's why like one click, like just clicking on like... <laughs> just clicking on this like is going to cost Schwab like 500 bucks. Sorry Schwab. Google Google's going to have a nice quarter. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to cost Chase money. I don't like them. I'm long a little SoFi, so I'm not clicking that. I'm not trying to charge SoFi $500. Let's let's make Fidelity pay too. Make them pay. All right, enough jokes. Options. So they, they actually break down transaction revenue, which is super cool. It's not illegal to click. Crypto's become a decent part of their business. I, it's unbelievable. Equities is like nothing. It's all options and crypto. It's just speculators. So that's one thing I think about is like, if it's DGEN's using it, right? And they're basically using it as a gambling app, right? Then what happens in a recession? You know, the customer base is probably quite different for Schwab and E-Trade or equities. Well, the other thing here is that options are extremely profitable. So even though a lot of trading is happening in options, they give the equities away. So it's not, okay, that sort of makes sense. We don't know, just because the revenue is from options doesn't mean the usage is all options. Just the options is so profitable. Where's the payment for order flow? Okay, other is from that gold thing which is pretty cool. Funded customers, wow, 24.2 billion, million. Where's the two million thing? Oh, Robinhood Gold is two million. Wow, oh shit, oh shit. Oh, totally wrong here. They have, damn. 24.2 million customers. So ARPU they have it at 113, but it doesn't make sense to me. They might be doing it off a different revenue number. But maybe they're doing it off just one of these or something like that. But I can make it my own definition. See, that's a ton. Maybe, maybe Fidelity or Goldman will buy them or someone. Yeah, no, my pleasure, Humphrey. Um, this is yield generating, right? So, like, the question is, are they generating the right amount of yield here? So, two eighty-five annualized. Are they only making one percent? I guess they they pass through when you're a brokerage you pass through most of the interest to the customer but you get that little spread. 
one percent is I think normal. That's what all the big brokerages charge for even prime brokerage. That's actually pretty good, one percent. Yeah. Now again, just because a company and everybody that watches me knows this, but I'm going to say it again. Just because a company looks like it's doing well doesn't mean the stock is good stock. And I know all of you know that. I just have to say it over and over again because it's the biggest misconception there is. Just because a company is doing well doesn't mean it's good stock. This is like anti-Peter Lynch. I think Peter Lynch was a great investor, but you just have to realize that expectations are can often be baked in. There's a lot of little metrics here. So they're, they're pretty transparent about all that. But I want to see a cash flow statement if possible. Let's see. Okay. Whew. I'm just going to do CFFO for now as a shortcut. I know you guys love watching me punch numbers in, but let's do it this way. Do we have a special guest? Oh. Around. Robin Hood is the bizarre left column, right column switch. Okay, they have very little cash flow. They had some big receivable from user thing. I don't know why. It seems to be pl plaguing their cash flow this year a little bit, but most likely transitory. They don't do CapEx, so it's a like virtual business. All probably on AWS or Azure. Very cool. I think the receivables from customers must be coming from gold. That explains it because gold is literally a credit card, right? So like their customers owe them money. So if we add back gold, markets are efficient, sure, but they're not always efficient. Otherwise, Warren Buffett would be out of business. Okay, so I'm going to do this add back. It's so complicated. Uh, 11168 here, and 111 minus this here. So I add this back. I want to make sure I got all these numbers right. Um, 370 here, right? Okay. Four. Okay, great. I think I got it all. So three months was negative seven forty-two. Add it back there, and then six months fifteen thirty-eight. Thirty-eight minus this guy, and this guy plus this guy. Okay. Um, I think that's the way to do it. All right, let's look at another quarter. Let me try this. I don't remember if I've ever met Vlad or chatted to him. Wow, look at the assets. The assets are the leading indicator. Whew. Just in two quarters? Grew like, what's that, 38%? Two quarters? It's almost too, good, almost too good to be true. And a lot of people think thought that uh, Robin was kind of left for dead after the GameStop fiasco, like alienating their, their main customer. 
Let's see, let's see. I do think cash flow is the important thing here. I mean, let's do one, let's do the prior year real quick, but this is just for housekeeping. we've all been waiting for. very lumpy, but they generated a billion in cash flow last year without the massive growth. The enterprise value is 12 billion. That's 12 times earnings, which for a company growing 40% is a wet dream. Sorry for the vivid imagination there. It's almost like too good to be true. Sometimes when things are too good to be true, you just, just, <laughs> just do it. I hope you're right. So let me try to do it this way, because if you exclude the cash, you could say it's 19 times earnings, because you're, you're double counting the benefit. The benefit of $7 billion is your earned interest on it. But if you put that interest in your income statement, is it really earnings? Not really, because you wouldn't have it without the cash. So you can't get, count both benefits, I don't think. So you can remove it from cash flow. If you remove it from cash flow, cash flow is only 1.2 billion. I think it's going to be more this year. We only have two quarters so far booked in the year, but so far cash flow is on pace to do a lot, quite a lot more, maybe double. I think they're going to have a, another weird Q3, but I don't know if that's seasonal or what, but probably just related to Robinhood Gold. Basically, people open the credit cards, they borrow lots of money, their cash flow goes down. It makes sense. Um, But even if you look at the, so exclude the cash, 
or exclude the interest income. If you exclude the interest income, at least from last year, Yeah, so basically, the concept of enterprise value is fairly simple. We all know it. But when you buy a stock, you buy a share of a container. And the container contains all the assets of the company. In this case, you've got the app and the cash flow that it makes. Got any property, plant, and equipment. But you also get their cash, which in this case is a large amount, seven billion. And you also get their debt, which in this case is zero. So when you buy the share, you get a little bit of all of this. If you buy 1% of the shares, you own 1% of all of these things together. And right now the price for all these things together is 19,460. But if I took out cash, because we know what cash is worth. We know that cash is just worth what we think it's worth. It's worth whatever the dollar value is. So it's actually very easy to decide what is the rest of the business worth. They have $7 billion in cash, so it's easy to say, well, the rest of the business must be worth $12.2 billion because, after all, the cash can't be worth any more than the $7.2 billion it's worth. So now the question becomes, well, what's this stuff worth? Well, they actually don't have much property, plant and equipment. I think they have like 100 mil or something. Yeah, basically zero. So we can get rid of PP&E. And they don't have any debt. So all you're really left with is this, is this, you're, you're paying 12 billion for this business. 7 billion for this cash. But the company's making a billion dollars. And that's last year. They might make 2 billion this year. So would you pay 12.2 billion for a company making 2 billion? Of course. It's not even a question. 6 times earnings. The only businesses you're going to find at 6 times earnings, they're trading at 6 times earnings because they're plummeting. Their earnings are going to plummet. Robinhood's earnings are going up. So you almost never can find a business like that. But the caveat, the caveat is some of those earnings are coming from interest that the cash is generating. So I would argue the right number would probably still be the 19 billion. But on even 19 billion, would you pay, if it was generating 1 billion, which is a lot, we know they, they can do 1 billion. We know that from last year. Um, would you pay 19 billion for a company that's growing 40% that's trading for 1 billion. Well, I can show you 100 software stocks where people are paying not 19 times earnings, they're paying 100 times earnings for this. If it's growing 40%, they're paying 100 times, 200 times earnings. So if they're gonna grow, if they're gonna do 2 billion, and they're gonna keep growing, that's like nine times earnings. And at a 40% growth rate, you know, again, I would look at a comp Let's look at a couple of comps here. Traditional software stocks, you know, and these are different kinds of companies, but they're not that different. Like a good example is Datadog. Roof. Datadog. Trailing 12 months earnings is 163 million. Datadog market cap is 37 billion. <laughs> Why is Datadog worth 37 billion? Cash flow is about a billion trailing, if I recall correctly. In fact, I can get it super quickly. Point being, the market's willing to pay 40 times earnings for Datadog, or more, possibly quite a bit more, I think, because of the insane growth that Datadog has. And Datadog's growth has slowed a bit. Let's see here. It's only 27%. So it's growing slower than Robinhood. But it's still um, you know that that's what people pay for growing software companies. They even have some CapEx too. It's not much, but for our purposes we can exclude it.
that's a good stock. At least at, at first blush, it looks good. You know, I I don't think you should trade unless you do many many hours of work. I would sign up to become a customer. I would compare it to other apps. I would go through the balance sheet and really fine detail. What are they investing in? Um, all right, so Datadog. So 493 cash flow last year, or last 439. So cash flow for, that's for 12 months. So it was about 100 a quarter, even if it's 200 a quarter now, which I don't think it will be. Market's paying 46 times earnings for Datadog. And that's typical if you look at Snowflake or Viva or whatever. If you're going that fast, you, you get the crazy multiple. So, yeah, looks like a good find. You know, again, caveat's always really important. You know, you never know what lurks behind the numbers. That's why you have to spend hours and hours and hours double checking. You can get 80, 90% of the picture right away. You can. But it's that 5 or 10% that's still important. You know, you have to go listen to every conference call, read every press release for the last two years, every SEC filing for the last two years at least. Um, try to talk to management if you can. These, these places have investor relations, uh, um, you know, uh, people. They're sitting there most of the day waiting to talk to you. Just give them a call. Tell them you're, tell them you're an investor. That's all you need to do. Um, and it's good practice for talking to management. Um, but the fact that their assets are... That's not even 40% year over year growth. That's 40% in two quarters. <laughs> it's, it's again, it's almost like hard to believe. Could you imagine? I mean, I, nobody else is growing like that. But, you know, they're, they're not the size of Schwab. I would look at, let, let's look at Schwab actually. Schwab's public. Here's Schwab's Q2. Client assets, 9.4 trill. Ooh. <laughs> so we can make another spreadsheet. Uh, brokers. So they, I mean, the good news is they have a lot of room to grow. Right? Schwab's kind of the incumbent. Morgan Stanley as a company is just sort of large in general. Most Dan. How about interactive? Forty-eight million in positions taken over for a customer. Ouch. Okay, I help me out, interactive. Okay, they, they call it customer equity. Robinhood's barely one percent of this industry, and I'm not—I mean, I'm not even including Fidelity. It's, I think a couple trillion. I want their brokerage. It's 
hard to say what fidelity is because we're including mutual fund and stuff like that. But you can see that there's plenty of growth possible for Robinhood. Yeah, if you think of it as a gambling company, that's, that's certainly one way to do it. And there's some recession fears, but look, some people, some people think we're in a recession now and they're growing 40%, so I don't know how bad a recession is going to hurt them. What's the average customer deposit? So they got 139 uh, billion, they got uh, 24 million customers. So average person has 5,000 bucks in Robinhood. I think in the other brokerages, it's closer to 20 or 20 or 20 to 100K. But, you know, that's who they cater to. They cater really well to those kinds of clients, the small clients. So what would the company be worth? I say 60 bucks. Why? <laughs> Keeping it really simple. You earn 2 billion in cash. 2 billion cash flow. 30 times earnings because it's growing so fast. That's it. 60 B. The cash I'm not in including because it's what helps them earn part of the 2 billion. The other way to do it would be take the 7 billion in cash. They would do a billion without the interest income, and you could put 30 on that. And you get 37, it's a little more conservative, so that's a double. Do it this way, you get a triple. I will say doing it this way may make a little more sense because the future earnings will be driven by Maybe the growth of their platform more than anything else. But either way, it's it's good long. But that's that's a quick look at it. I, I'm you know, I really can't um, express enough that you have to be really, really patient and sharp about how you do this. JP Morgan would, would be a good acquirer, obviously. There's a lot of companies that would love Robinhood, even a non-financial company, quite honestly, someone like Google or Apple. You know, would make a lot of sense to, to buy Robinhood, um, integrate it with their services. Um, you know, a Coinbase. You know, uh, Robinhood might be bigger than Coinbase, and I, they're pretty direct competitors. But Square is another one. Again, a competitor, maybe more than a customer, but they're the crypto. Crypto is the overlap there. So lots of strategic options for Robinhood, but I, I, mean, I think their goal is to grow and they'll be buying those kinds of companies maybe. <laughs> um, but again, I, I would also look at, let's look at, um, let's look at it this way as well. I think they make more per, for their cust from their customers than these other guys. But if you look at like Schwab's market cap, right? Schwab is worth 116 billion. Robinhood's at, yeah, so this this is kind of alarming, right? It's like which one of these doesn't belong? So market cap per AUM. A dollar in deposits for Schwab is worth ten dollars in deposits for Robinhood. Does that make sense? Well, the Robinhood investor is churning his account, he's borrowing a lot, he's doing a lot of options. The Schwab guy isn't. So to me, I still care about the earnings, which is what's important. But that does alarm me a little bit. Schwab guy's got his retirement account in there. He's not. He's going to look at it once a year. So he's sure they got a ton of assets, but it's not that they're not valuable assets because the gambler's churning, the day trader's churning. So 
even though that's you know it's a little alarming, it 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 kind of shows you that they're actually getting the much more valuable customer, even though it's smaller on a per per customer basis, they're earning a ton. So I don't think it's that big of a deal. Yeah, Interactive has a higher end client, but they're still also a little bit less churny. And they're cheaper. They're 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 not screwing you over on options trades, whereas Robinhood might be a little pricey on the options trading. But you know, Interactive is not that much bigger than Robinhood on assets. On market cap, it's smaller. 